Welcome back. Uh, for those of you who were not here yesterday at, uh, to hear Larry's keynote, I would like to introduce him once more. Uh, Larry is a very active member, very active contributor to the Drupal project. He's uh, basically the principal architect of the Drupal 7 database system. He's the Drupal 8 web services lead, and he's also the person responsible for integrating Symfony into Drupal 8. So you're about to hear something very interesting. If you're interested in CMS in general, especially particularly in Drupal, enjoy, guys. Thank you. So I said, my name is Larry Garfield. You may know me online as Krell. If you want to make fun of me on Twitter during the session, please do so. That's uh, how you do it. I'm a senior architect with Palantir.net. We're a web services firm based in Chicago. Uh, we do end-to-end -end development, uh, consulting, content strategy, design, pretty much everything except hosting we do, mostly but not exclusively with Drupal. Uh, as the web services lead for Drupal 8, uh, Drupal representative to the Framework Interoperability Group. If anyone didn't hear the joke yesterday, the Framework Interoperability Group is like the United Nations of PHP with all the good and bad parts of that. Uh, advisor of the Drupal Association and general purpose level pedant. We're going to go through a lot of code uh, in this session, so if you want to play along at home, uh, you can go ahead and grab code here for those of you who want to have laptops out, or the code's there, you can download it at any time. Slides will be available afterward as well. So, let's talk about Drupal 8. Who's heard of Drupal? Good. Who's heard of Drupal 8? Who's tried using Drupal 8? All right, that's good. <laughs> So what I hear a lot from Drupal developers as I you know, travel around is this. Well, Drupal 8 is so different than what we're used to. Well, how will I ever learn it? Who's in that category? One person's going to own up to it, two people? OK, OK. The other thing I hear is this. Drupal 8 is finally not weird. Does that mean I can actually use it? Who's in this category? A couple more people. OK. I'm happy to say that the answer to both of these questions is yes, in part because you know, the more things change, the more they stay the same. This is still Drupal. It's heavily refactored under the hood, but it's still Drupal. The concepts themselves of how the architecture works, how you build a site, are still Drupal. They're still the Drupal we're used to. The architecture under the hood, however, has been greatly modernized, greatly improved, greatly refactored to be more in line with more, con more modern techniques, more uh, in line with other systems you'll run into. And the APIs are far more consistent. You'll find, if, uh, those of you who have worked with Drupal 7 before, uh, its APIs tend to be somewhat idiomatic, somewhat inconsistent in places. That's been vastly improved. And that is Drupal 8. Thank you. No. <clears throat> so this is only a, a short talk, so I'm going to focus on broad strokes. As we go through code samples here, please don't look at specific API calls. That's not the point. I want you to look at the patterns. Look at the pr process you go through, the patterns of the system. And that will kind of give you a sense of what to look for as you go through the documentation later on your own to learn Drupal 8. So let's start with just a little bit of theory. This is how the vast majority of PHP 4 applications, which includes Drupal 7, were architected. Process starts up. You have a bunch of super globals that get created, and your code does stuff, whatever stuff that is, and stuff comes down to calling the header function and printing content out. And hopefully in that order, because if you get that order wrong, then weird things happen and stuff breaks in weird, mysterious ways. Problem. That's not actually how the web works. The web, by which I mean HTTP, looks more like this. You have a request message that comes in, in HTTP, and your server does some kind of black magic, whatever your code is supposed to be, and a response message comes out. We're not about talking about printing things, we're talking about message passing. <clears throat> and for Drupal 8, we said, you know what? This is where we need to be. This is how the web actually works. This is where we want to be. This is our architecture that we should have. Is there anything that's already closer to this that we can leverage? And turns out the answer is yes. It's called Symfony. Symfony's HTTP kernel. Who's worked with Symfony before? About half the room. Good. Symfony's HTTP kernel uh, works on exactly this model. Request comes in, model does an object, and then you have an HTTP kernel, which 
does black magic, and a response message object comes out. In fact, this is the entire core of Symfony is one method. One method on this HTTP kernel interface that is passed a request object and returns a response object. You can ignore this stuff for now. That is all of Symfony, and any Symfony-based system has this at its core. Drupal, Symfony, Silex, Laravel, they all have the same basic core. And Symfony also ships with a default implementation of this interface that Drupal is using, as is Symfony, as is Silex, as are a whole bunch of other systems, that looks kind of like this. It's a little bit small here, but you have a request that comes in, and then a request event fires. The request event uh, gives you an opportunity to modify the request. Drupal people in the room think hook request alter, same basic idea. And one of the most important things that happens here is routing, typically, uh, which is, all right, this request is going to get handled by what controller? Then there's a controller event, think hook request post routing alter, essentially. Then a controller fires, this is your code, and the controller can return something that is a response or not a response. If it's not a response, a view event fires, and that view event is an opportunity for code to hook in and say, I recognize whatever this thing is, and I know how to turn it into a response. And different listeners get called in order until one of them says, aha, I can handle it, turn that into a response, pass it back, and we're done. In either case, then, there's a response event. Think hook response alter. And the response gets sent. And then there's a terminate event to shut down uh, any, and do any uh, last minute cleanup. This is the core of Symfony. It's the core of Drupal 8. It's the core of Silex. It's the core of about a dozen different PHP systems at this point. <clears throat> so let's talk about controllers. In Drupal 7, we call these things page callbacks. Uh, same basic idea in Drupal 8, because we're using uh, Symfony, they can be any callable. That is, pretty much anything in PHP you can put parentheses after and it doesn't break. So a function, a method of an object, a static method of a class, uh, a closure, all of these things are callables in PHP. In practice, in Drupal, 99.9% .9 of the time it will be a method of an object. Technically, the system mostly supports doing other things, but this is the only one you're ever going to use. Controllers can be as simple as this. We've got a class called MyController's, and we've got this method called hello, <clears throat> and you know, we, we get called, and then we send this response. And this response is the entire response that goes back. It's the entire HTML response that we're sending back. Important thing to note, in Drupal parlance, this is a controller. This is not a controller, this is a class. This is a controller. The method is the controller. The callable is the controller. <clears throat> and you can put multiple controllers in the same class. In this case, we're also going to add this hello JSON uh, method, controller. And instead of returning a response, we're returning a JSON response. It's just a subclass of response that we pass uh, an associative array to of some blob of data. It will take that, JSONify it, <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, set the correct headers, set the correct uh, content length, all the various stuff you need to do with HTTP, it'll take care of it. It's just all wrapped up into that class. Nice and simple. We can get fancier than this, too. One of my favorites is streamed response. If you're, say, generating a, a CSV file or some kind of uh, audit dump, what you don't want to do is pull data out of your database and build up this gigantic formatted string that is your entire CSV file, and pass that around in your system for a while, and then at the end you print that. And that's terrible, because you now have this ginormous CSV string sitting in memory that you're passing around. And if you're putting out a million records, uh, that's just not going to work. Your server's going to hate you, and then your server admin's going to hate you, and you really don't want your server admin to hate you, believe me. Instead, <clears throat> we create a streamed response, and in this case we're going to set the header on it to text CSV, and then we set a callback, which is just, again, any callable. In this case, it's a closure. And then later on, when the response gets sent, <clears throat> this callback gets called, and we can just print out 
our data one line at a time. So we've got this, some gigantic blob of data, say a database uh, result, and we iterate over that, and one line at a time, print out a CSV line. Which means we're never using more than a few K of memory at once, and we never blow out our server memory, and we never make our server admin unhappy. Yay! A special case of that, binary file response. You want to send a file off disk? Great. Just wrap it up in a pile of binary file response. It will figure out the correct MIME type. It will set the content disposition header or whatever that is. I don't even think about that. It just takes care of it. I like mentioning this one because this is not something that Symfony had originally. This is a capability that <clears throat> uh, Drupal developers added to Symfony because we do private file handling, so you can have files that are, are only accessible to authenticated users. So you have to route that through PHP. So we need this kind of object. There's nothing Drupal specific about it, so great, push it upstream to Symfony. Yay, open source. In practice, though, most of the time, you will not be returning a response, but return something called a render array. A render array is a Drupalism. Uh, it's kind of, for those who are not used to Drupal, um, it's kind of like an abstract syntax tree of the data you want to get rendered. <coughs> um, basic model is hash theme is the name of <coughs> a theme key or a theme function that, or, a, or a template. Uh, that will render this data, and the rest is hash something, and those are variables that will get passed to uh, the theme system. We'll talk about this a bit more in a moment, but this is usually what you'll be returning from your controllers. And you can also get uh, data from the request. So if you have a, a URL, a hello world from to, then we just specify those variable names in our method and those variables get mapped directly and are available to our controller to do whatever we want with. But I've got from and to here, and here's to and from. Does that matter? No, actually it doesn't matter at all. It's mapped on the variable name, uh, excuse me, uh, mapped on the string name, not on position. So you can put it in any position you want. You can also just throw in request, and you'll get the full request passed to you as well. Usually you only need that if, uh, you're doing something with query parameters, which is not often. And then you tell the system about it. Again, we'll see this again in a moment. Give it a, a route name. Give it a path. Here's our path. And there's the controller we specify, class name method, class name method. And we're done. And now requests to that path we get passed to this controller. and that data uh, is, is available to us. And so far, I have not actually told you anything about Drupal aside from render arrays. Everything else I've mentioned so far is just general Symfony. All of this part of the system, we ripped out and replaced with Symfony because they did it better than we did, and why rewrite the wheel? I'm sure some of you are now saying, okay, Larry, stop talking, tell me something useful. When developing for Drupal, there's really only two steps involved in the majority case. Build a tool, wire it up. That is most of Drupal right there. Build a tool, wire it up. Don't solve the problem. Build a tool that will solve your problem and connect it into the system, which is generally good advice for most developments. Don't solve the problem at hand. Build a tool that will solve the problem that you can then use and reuse if necessary. <clears throat> Put another way, you're going to extend a base class or implement an interface and you're going to tell Drupal about it. That tell Drupal about it is going to vary, but that's the basic idea. We'll see this pattern over and over again. So how do we make a module? It's a Drupal extension. Uh, Drupal is designed to make everything run through modules for the most part, so most of your work is going to be defining modules. How do you make a module? Well, in the top of a Drupal 8 site, we've got a modules directory. That's where your add-on modules go. We're going to create a directory called hugs, which is the name of our module, and it's going to have a hugs.info.yaml file. Drupal 8 loves using YAML. We use it for almost everything. Um, and in that file, we just have a couple of keys. Name of our module, so hugs lowercase is the machine name. That's how Drupal knows it. This name here is the human readable name, a human readable description. We specify a type of module because themes use the same syntax, and the Drupal core version that it depends on, which at this point is always going to be eight. 
That's it. We now have a module that shows up on our admin that we can enable, disable, install, uninstall, and so forth. We do not need a dot module file anymore. Drupal developers in, in the room cheer. You no longer need to have a dot module file if you have no code for it. Yay! OK, problem solved. It's not so useful, though. We have a module that does, it does absolutely nothing. Let's fix that. Let's make a page. How do we set up a page in Drupal? Well, what's our pattern? Create a tool, wire it up. Extend a base class, wire it up. <clears throat> so let's make a new controller. In practice, we have a class called controller base. You do not have to extend from that, but the majority of the time, it'll just be easier if you do so for your controllers. Uh, it has a bunch of useful utilities on it. For example, uh, we've got this hug method. 